I'm Dr. Harriet Vance Ball, cardiologist and associate professor of medicine from McMaster University in Canada. And I am delighted to have with me Professor David Wheeler, the co-principal investigator of the DAPA CKD trial, a landmark trial presented at the ESC meeting this week. Welcome, Professor Wheeler. Thank you, Dr. Van Spell. It's my pleasure to be here. So you co-led this trial with Dr. Hurstbank, who presented the results um, a couple of days ago. Why don't you tell us about the inclusion criteria and the methodology of this trial? No, of course, um, I'd, I'd be delighted to do that. So we, we took dapagliflozin, which is, of course, a, a, a drug designed to treat diabetes. Um, and we had a, a pretty good idea when we started the trial that, that this drug would improve outcomes in, in patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Um, but we also had uh, the thought that the drug might help patients who had chronic kidney disease that wasn't due to diabetes. So we recruited patients both with and without diabetes into the DAPA CKD trial. They all had chronic kidney disease, they all had albuminuria, um, but around about um, a third of them actually didn't have type 2 diabetes as a comorbidity. Right, so eligible patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either dapagliflozin 10 milligrams a day or to placebo on a background of ACE and ARB therapy. Um, would you like to tell us about your trial population and their characteristics? Yeah, so ACEs and ARBs are, are, are standard care in this population. So we wanted um, as many patients as possible to be on ACEs and ARBs. Um, we recruited patients who had certain biomarkers of, of kidney disease, so GFRs between 25 and 75, and high levels of, of albuminuria. So we recruited a, a group of patients who had effectively established chronic kidney disease based on EGFR criteria and albuminuria criteria. Um, and the vast majority of them were, were on ACEs and ARBs. Um, those that had diabetes needed to have reasonably well-controlled diabetes. Right. Important to note uh, in terms of implementation of the study results that you excluded patients with type 1 diabetes and those with uh, some inherited conditions such as polycystic kidney disease, uh, lupus nephritis, and anca vasculitis. Yeah. So, right. so we... We decided that there were kidney diseases that were unlikely to be impacted by, by this drug because of the very nature of the underlying kidney disease. Um, so we actually excluded patients with a genetic condition, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease with cysts grow in the kidneys. We didn't think the drug would reverse cyst growth. Um, and also patients who had active immune mediated kidney disease who were on immunosuppression, so lupus, for example. And we excluded patients with, with type 1 diabetes, um, I think largely because we, we were concerned about safety issues um, with the drug in patients with type 1 diabetes, particularly diabetic ketoacidosis, which has been a problem in, in type right. 1 diabetics treated with these compounds. Right, and they've been routinely excluded from trials of SVLT2 inhibitors. You also excluded those with severe heart failure and those who were in the post-MI setting or had been recently revascularized. And I bring that up because we're cardiologists and so these are important facts to note for our cardiology viewers. Yeah, but only recent MI. So, so we patients with a, with a history of, of myocardial infarction going back, you know, a few months were, were allowed in, but patients who were just recovering for, from an MI weren't allowed in. Heart failure is difficult in, in kidney disease because when the kidneys don't work well, the patients get fluid overloaded and, and you know, may get diagnosed as having heart failure. Um, but we didn't want to include patients who were, you know, breathless and um, severely, um, uh, their, their physical activity was severely impaired by, by their heart failure. So we didn't include the higher New York classes uh, of heart failure. Right. So you had about 4,300 patients in your trial population. And after a mean duration of follow-up of about two and a half years, 
you had some remarkable effects noted in your primary endpoint. Why don't you tell us how you went about selecting the primary endpoint and what your findings were? So the primary endpoint was a composite, which was largely a, a renal um, composite. So it included things that matter to patients with, with kidney disease, dialysis, the need for a kidney transplant, reaching what we call end-stage kidney disease, um, a, a GFR um, below 15 mil per minute, but also declines in, in GFR so that we could pick up those patients who had um, early deterioration in, in their kidney function during the trial. Um, we had uh, um, uh, what we called renal death in the endpoint, which meant death due to untreated end-stage kidney disease, and we put cardiovascular death in the endpoint as well. Um, so the, the, the primary was a composite of, of renal endpoints with cardiovascular death. Right, and what were your findings? Well, the trial was actually stopped early um, by the Data Safety Monitoring Board, which surprised us um, a little bit. Um, the Data Safety Monitoring Board uh, informed the steering committee that they'd stopped the trial due to the overwhelming efficacy of the drug. Uh, so that was quite exciting. Um, we therefore closed the trial down. Um, we uh, ensured that all the patients came up for their final study visits. And, and then um, in, in July of this year, we, we were able to unblind and look at the data. Um, I think Based on what we knew already, as I said, there was, we, we felt there was a good chance that patients with diabetes may benefit from this intervention in terms of that primary composite endpoint. Um, but I think what, uh, what we were really pleased to see uh, was that the patients who'd been recruited without diabetes also benefited um, from the intervention. Uh, and, and on top of that, we saw a mortality benefit as well. So when we looked at all-cause mortality, which was one of our pre-specified secondary endpoints, um, we saw a reduction in, in all-cause mortality uh, in, in, the, in this patient population. Uh, right. And that's, that's important because this is the first trial that we're aware of that's shown a reduction in all-cause mortality in, in a group of patients with chronic kidney disease. Right, remarkable findings. So the um, hazard ratio for the primary endpoint, um, the primary composite renal endpoint, which also included death from cardiovascular causes yeah. was 0.61 with a relatively small confidence interval. So a good amount of precision. Um, and as you say, the benefit um, applied to those without diabetes, which is also remarkable and which is congruent with the findings of DAPA HF, which was presented last year, of course. And all of the secondary endpoints also um, were reduced with this intervention. So what are your thoughts on the implications and how one might go about implementing this drug. Certainly there has been some inertia in the uptake of SGLT2s in uh, those with chronic kidney disease, despite a past trial that assessed the efficacy of an SGLT2. Uh, I believe that was the Credence trial. Um, so what do you think the implications are and how might implementation efforts be more successful in applying these findings to our patients? So look, some really good questions. Um, Credence looked at a, a group of patients with, with diabetes and they all had diabetes and chronic kidney disease um, and also read out positively. So um, there was a similar combined renal uh, composite endpoint that included cardiovascular death as well. And the results of that study you know, were released in April 2019. It took a good year for the licensing to change. And I think we are now beginning to see uh, changes in the therapeutic approach that we're, we're taking to these patients. But we should remember that these are diabetes drugs and, and kidney doctors may be initially a little bit reluctant to treat patients who don't have diabetes with diabetes drugs. So I think um, we're going to have to do um, uh, a lot of education among healthcare professionals uh, share our results, uh, reassure uh, people about the safety, because the safety profile of the drug was, was good during the study. 
um, and uh, slowly start to, to change people uh, or, or healthcare professionals' prescribing habits. Um, and, and also perhaps, uh, you know, work with patients to, uh, to understand, um, you know, why uh, they, they would want this drug and, and what would help them um, in terms of their interactions with the healthcare professionals. Right. You did mention safety endpoints, and so we should probably add there was no di diabetic ketoacidosis seen in the intervention group, which I found quite remarkable because there was some uh, that was noted in the placebo group. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you talk about the safety endpoints and what the findings yeah. are? So, so we saw, you know, the expected um, side effects with, with this drug. Um, in fact, we were only we, we, we pre-selected the safety point safety endpoints that we, we were going to look at, um, and we were particularly concerned about diabetic ketoacidosis uh, and hypoglycemia. Um, we actually saw no ketoacidosis or, or hypoglycemia in the um, in in the patients who didn't have diabetes who went into the trial. So that was hugely reassuring. Um, there was no excess of amputations. That's been a concern um, with drugs in this class from previous studies. Uh, and we saw, we saw no unexpected safety signals that, that we hadn't predicted, even in the patients who didn't have type 2 diabetes going into the study. So I think we were um, reassured by the safety data that came out of the trial. Right. So congratulations on a well-conducted trial, which has um, a, a great um, um, implications on patients with chronic kidney disease um, that can offer our patients with chronic disease uh, improvements in multiple endpoints uh, that include renal endpoints, cardiovascular endpoints, and importantly, all-cause mortality. How are you going to celebrate the end of this trial, it's, it's a sort of a different environment now in the virtual meeting space. It's not quite the same as presenting to a large audience and uh, celebrating with your colleagues and co-investigators. What are you doing as a team to celebrate? Yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, we, you know, it's very efficient doing virtual meetings and you can get a, a large number of people. Um, a, a lot of our emails have, have carried sort of images of champagne glasses um, mm -hmm. and, and, and crackers and um, stars and celebration, but, but we've missed the opportunity to celebrate. And, and I think what we're going to do is, is stall the celebration for a few months until we can meet face to face and then we'll, we'll have the party then. Wonderful. I thank you so much for joining me today. It was my pleasure and an honor to meet you. And I wish you well in your ongoing research and celebrations. Thank you. Delighted to talk to you. Thank you very much.